Well, welcome this morning. I'm Pastor Matt, and we're just so thankful, again, that you chose to worship with us today. Normally, we would have our announcement time, but, but we're changing things up a little bit today, and we're going to be uh, opening up our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. Yes, this is our 13th message in our Gospel of Mark series. If you are new to Springfield Assembly, or if this is your first time in a long time, uh, we started this series through the Gospel of Mark at the last Sunday in February. And with a few breaks here and there, I would like to announce we are just over halfway through the third chapter. As we promised, this was going to be a long series, and not because Pastor Eric and I are long-winded. Um, amen, right? Of course, everyone has said amen. Um, but rather because we are traveling through this gospel verse by verse. Verse by verse through the gospel of Mark, which I have loved so far and am looking forward as we continue through this series. God's word is powerful. God's word is powerful, especially when we take it in, all in together like we are through this series. Marching through one book over an extended period of time gives us greater insight into the scriptures. It reveals to us the full counsel of God that this book is trying to give to us. And one of my favorite reasons is when we walk through the word of God and let it speak for itself, I truly believe that God sets up without us even knowing these divine appointments all along the way. If you have missed any of the sermons in this series, or perhaps you'd like a refresher, you can go to our Facebook page or to our YouTube page where they are listed. But this morning, our message is entitled, Two Lies and a Truth. Two Lies and a Truth. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, join me in Mark chapter 3, and we're going to be reading, starting with verse 20 this morning. Mark chapter 3 starting with verse 20 and I'll be reading from the English standard version of the Bible this morning here we go it says this then he speaking of Jesus then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat and when his family heard it they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons and he called them to him and said to them in parables again this is Jesus talking how can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we ask that as we dive into it, that you would speak to us. God, we thank you for you, what we have already encountered this morning, for the presence and the joy of the Lord that filled our time of worship, for the opportunity to give back to you. And now, as we open up your word, God, may it pierce our hearts. Speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, the first lie that we see in our text today is this, that Jesus was out of his mind. 
Mark 3, verses 20 and 21 says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. There is no doubt about it. There came a time in Jesus Christ's ministry when his family thought he had lost his mind and felt the need to go out and to seize him. The Greek text uses a very strong expression that went out to seize literally means to arrest. So Jesus' family, perhaps his brothers, went down to Capernaum with the sole intention of forcibly taking Jesus under control and hauling him back home to Nazareth. Why? Well, first you could imagine they, they loved him and they, they thought whatever was happening it shouldn't be happening if, if he was really struggling. And second, they went to such extremes as uh, they were afraid that this religious fervor of Jesus was going to ruin his health. That this shift in Jesus' life and ministry was going to ruin his health. And this is clear from the way that Mark structured his explanation on why they went down to seize Jesus. They said he wasn't able to eat. The crowds were so big. But there could be a number of other possible reasons why some of his own people thought that Jesus was out of his mind. First, it could have been that he left the family business to become an itinerant preacher. I know when I told my family that I wanted to be a preacher, they thought I was out of my mind. Perhaps his family uh, was afraid for Jesus because they had heard the rumors about the religious leaders plotting to kill him. Perhaps it was the huge crowds who began to follow Jesus. What if they thought the fame and attention and celebrity had gone to his head? Perhaps the shift in Jesus' life caused them to think, what is wrong with him? How is he showing all this spiritual power now? Maybe they hadn't seen it before. Oh, and don't forget the group of disciples that he picked. The group of people that he called to be his followers. We've looked at this already in this series, but, but Jesus called a tax collector. No one wanted to associate with tax collectors, and yet Jesus is asking one to follow him. He had called fishermen. Fishermen were dirty and smelly and stinky, but yet Jesus calls fishermen to his side. He calls people who were kind of a bent towards violence and these sons of thunder. I mean, who was Jesus calling? He had to be out of his mind. But on top of all that could have been, there was this that we know. The scripture tells us that the pressure from the crowds had invaded their home base and eventually started to affect their health as they didn't have time to eat. In a culture, a Jewish culture that was set on rhythms and cycles, eating was a very important rhythm and cycle. Jewish tradition recognizes a meal as a time of intimacy, a time of fellowship, and a time of significant conversation. This was a place to share the stories of old, the traditions of their faith. There was this prayer, which was a group of Bible verses that they would often recite at each meal called the Shema. And this was the time to do that. Meals were the time to pour in to the younger generations and to pass on the faith. In the American South, you can call me any name you want, but don't call me late for dinner. And Jesus, missing meals in an Israelite culture, was enough for his family to think that he had lost his mind. Now let's jump up into the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, uh, 26, verses uh, 24. We see where there are other people who are called crazy. 
This is of Paul, it says, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festive said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Similar verdicts have been rendered over history of people who had followed Jesus. Martin Luther was called crazy for what he did in standing against the Catholic Church. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, he was accused of being a madman taking his stance for Christ. And these are people you may know. But what about someone you may not know from history? His name is William Borden. William Borden, his family was one of the wealthiest families around in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He experienced a call to ministry, and while attending Princeton Seminary, William felt the call to the mission field, and he left everything behind to answer that call. He traveled to Egypt in 1913 to learn Arabic so he could minister to the Uyghur Muslims in China, and it was there he contracted a form of meningitis and he died, never reaching his mission field. To the world, William Borden was crazy. Why would anyone leave extravagant wealth and celebrity to answer the call of Jesus? What a madman he must have been. But church, if you don't hear anything today, hear this. When Jesus was following the leading of his father, it made him look like madmen even to his own family. Today, following Jesus will more than likely make people look at you the way they did Jesus. Following Jesus more than likely will make those around you question your sanity. But the sanest thing anyone can do is live sold out to Jesus. The sanest thing that anyone can do is to live sold out to Jesus. Because the sanest person to ever live was Jesus Christ. So the first lie that people said about Jesus, or maybe a misconception was that he was a madman. And the second is this. In verse 22 of our chapter, we see this. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And then verse 30, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now what is happening in this text is Jesus was causing quite the stir out in the country regions outside of Jerusalem. So the leaders of the temple in Jerusalem have sent a party of people to go and to investigate what is happening and this is this group, these scribes who have come down from Jerusalem are there to see what this Jesus really is about. And their conclusion was satanic. Now, I'm not going to be spending really any time other than these few sentences on the idea of the unforgivable sin that this text covers. And let me share with you what I have read every scholar to believe. If you are concerned or worried that you have committed the unforgivable sin, you haven't. You haven't. Those who would blaspheme against the Holy Spirit are those who are knowingly making a conscious decision to ascribe what God is doing as something that is demonic, which was why... Mark adds, verse 30, after Jesus says all he says in his parables about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and Mark 30, or 330 says, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. They were looking at Jesus. These men who were trained in the Bible, who knew the Old Testament inside and out, they were not ignorant to the word of God, and they looked at Jesus and they said, he has an unclean spirit. Now, they didn't commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus said they were very close. So if you are concerned or worried that you have committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, thus the unforgivable sin, you haven't. Because those who have wouldn't care if they did. 
So they have this idea that Jesus is either possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he cast out demons, and he has an unclean spirit. The lie is that Jesus was possessed by the devil. He was in league working with the prince of demons, and that was a lie. Jesus had obvious power, obvious power, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. But the religious leaders had a problem with that power. And the problem was, one, they didn't have it, and two, they couldn't control the man who did. And when people in power, when people in authority feel their authority threatened, their only response is, it must be the devil. So since they, the religious elite, didn't have the power and Jesus wasn't on their side, they thought he must be the devil. Obvious supernatural power. They didn't have it. They couldn't control it. So it must not be good. But Jesus had a response to that. And he had called them to him and said to the parables in verse 23 and following, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And a house divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand and is coming to an end. Jesus' response is perfect. As sensical as it is powerful. A kingdom against itself. A house divided against itself. Neither can stand. And this truth, these words of Jesus have rang out throughout the ages. Abraham Lincoln invoked the words of Jesus in a speech given on June 16, 1858, at what was then the Illinois State Capitol in Springfield, after he had accepted the Illinois Republican Party nomination to be the state's U.S. Senator. The nomination of Lincoln was the final item of business at the convention, and then after dinner, they came back for some speeches in which Abraham Lincoln was the only one who would speak. And his now famous speech started like this. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will either become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. I think it's fitting that in this series, that again, we started the last Sunday in February with a little break for Easter, that this passage, these words of Jesus would fall not only on Father's Day, but also on the newest federal holiday, Juneteenth. It was these words of Jesus that Abraham Lincoln correctly, and I believe quite prophetically, applied to his day and time. And it was these words of Jesus that launched not only his race for Senate in 1958, but would be a huge part of his framework for viewing his life in politics. It was a deeply held conviction of Abraham Lincoln that ultimately led, when he was president, to the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. The proclamation changed the legal status of more than three and a half million African American slaves in the Confederate States 
It changed their status from enslaved to free. This proclamation reached the far reaches of the Confederacy with the last of the slaves being freed in Galveston, Texas in the summer of 1865. Ever since then, June 19th has been celebrated as Emancipation Day, Jubilee Day, Freedom Day, or as we call it today, Juneteenth. Lincoln knew the words of Jesus were not just true in regards to Satan, but that this truth would apply to your house, to my house, and even the White House. These words of Jesus, spoken with power and authority, changed the course of history for our country. Jesus had power and authority, but they were not from Satan. Which means only one thing. They must come from God himself. So lie number one, Jesus was a madman. Nope. He was the sanest man to ever live. Lie number two, Jesus was possessed by Satan. No. It was just Jesus' obvious power and authority threatened those who were in power and they called him satanic which leads me to the truth in the passage this morning who is jesus well let's read verse 27 it says this but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house in this parable, the strong man is Satan. His house is the kingdom that he dominates here on earth. His goods are his victims who he holds in bondage through his demons. And only one who is stronger than Satan can free the victims. And that is what Jesus had done, was doing, and is still doing today entering Satan's house, binding him, and loosing those who had been captured spiritually or physically. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the strongest man. Now, growing up, there was no one stronger than my dad. My dad, in all of his six foot three, 250 pounds, ish pound frame was Goliath like to a small kid if you see the picture there my dad towering over those eight and nine year olds me with an amazing mullet an awesome spike bang thank you mom my dad to me was huge his hands were huge his head even bigger One day I was playing outside. I was eight or nine years old. And the bully, the neighborhood bully, started to pick on me and my friends while we were playing touch football. My mom, who was outside on the back porch ironing, witnessed this happen. Being the woman of God that she is, she calmly called my sister over who was doing whatever 11 or 12 year old girls would be doing at the time and she instructed her to go over and let me put it like this end that bully's reign of terror my sister also very strong proceeded to end the bully's reign of terror through the means of her brute strength and a fist or two well, like most bullies, he was all bark and no bite, and he took off running to his home to tell his father. Now, the rest of this story could be true. This is how I remember it 30 years later. I think it's true, and I didn't call to reference or to check because I want it to be true. <laughs> so this dad of this bully came stomping to our house, and he banged on our apartment door, shouting. 
And when my dad's six foot three frame filled the doorway, this five foot nothing man changed his tone and politely asked that if his daughter would please stop beating up his son. And he walked away. There is nothing like a strong dad, much like I am in my daughter's eyes. See, Jesus isn't just a strong man. He is the strongest man. Simply put, the Gospel of Mark up to this point has been talking about how Jesus is the Messiah. And this parable of Jesus flat out says it like it is. Jesus, he is the Lord. He is God. In C.S. Lewis's 1944 book, A Case for Christianity. He wrote this. You'll see a little quote up on the screen, but I'm going to read the full quote. The full quote is this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really silly thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we mustn't say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But don't let us come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. As Stephen comes up and we get ready to close, let me ask you this question. Who is Jesus to you today? Have you bought into the lies that would say Jesus isn't who he says He is. He's just a liar. It's a fraud. It's all a hoax. It's all make-believe. It's the opiate of the masses. Or do you see him for who he truly is and what he claimed to be from the beginning, our Savior and our Lord? If you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, today would be an awesome day day to do it he is a good father he is our heavenly father and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life I have a son and I wouldn't give him up for any of y'all and if you have kids you'd say the same thing but God sent his son Jesus to die so that we could live with him forever. Now, Jesus didn't just stay dead. When he died on that cross, he beat hell, death, and the grave when he resurrected three days later. And because Jesus rose again, we someday will rise with him as well. That is the gospel. And that gospel is for every single person. The whosoevers, no matter how you vote, no matter your skin color, no matter what you've done in the past, his grace and forgiveness is for you today. And it's just a simple prayer. It says, Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, be my Savior. I give my life, I give my heart to you today. It starts with a prayer, but it doesn't end there. 
the Holy Spirit enters in and he starts doing work. And as we pray and as we read our Bible and, and as we spend time worshiping with one another and growing in community, the Holy Spirit works on us and he changes us from the inside out. And if you've never started that journey today, you can. But if you have accepted Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus today, let me talk to you. I've noticed in my years of ministry that there are so many in the church with this kind of half in, half out mentality, holding up the proverbial wall, inserting themselves when it's convenient and withholding obedience to the word of God when faced with difficulty. This withholding isn't because they think Jesus is demonic. Which leads me to my question. This morning, are you withholding your obedience and full devotion to Jesus because you don't want people to think you're crazy? Because you've started living for the applause and the acceptance of man instead of living for the applause of your Father in heaven? If Christ is who he says he is, then the sanest thing you can do in this life is to follow him with all you have. If Christ calls us to total commitment, which he does, anything less than being all in for Jesus is crazy. Christianity, if it's crazy to the world, then we need more of that kind of craziness. Believer, there is no on-the-fence Christianity. We are called to be all in for Him. Dads, be all in. Set the tone for your family. Don't let Jesus be an afterthought or an addition to your life and family. Let Jesus be what he needs to be, what he calls us to be, which is the source of our life. He's not a great addition to it. He is the source of it. Teenagers, be all in. And I say teenagers, but I think adults fit in this category too. We care so much about what people think of us in the light of eternity. Who cares what people think of you? If you're gonna be called crazy for being a follower of Jesus, then be the craziest follower of Jesus. Chase after him. And to everyone this morning, this world doesn't need Christians that are comfortable in a seat in a church it needs a church set on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit following Jesus with reckless abandon, shining the light of Jesus so bright, lifting him up so that he can draw all men to himself. Who is Jesus to you today? As C.S. Lewis would put it, He's either a liar in the pits of hell. He is either a lunatic up there with someone who calls himself a poached egg. Or he is who he says he is, which is Lord. And it is that decision for us today that should dictate how we live our lives. And if he is our Lord, if he is your Lord, And you will forsake the opinions of others. You will follow him.